Is the conflict in the Middle East about to play out on the streets of Britain? Iran has bombarded Israel with hundreds of missiles. Well, as you can see, it looks as though many did pierce the Iron Dome. We've not seen anything like this, really, for decades. Israel will surely strike back, and then what happens? But as I sit here in Britain, my main concern is how this affects us. Now, intelligence agencies believe that Iran has organised and funded sleeper terror cells across Europe, including the UK, and could greenlight attacks in response to a conflict in the Gulf. The cells are operated by radicals linked to Hezbollah, the Lebanese militant group. Counter-terror police disrupted a cell in 2015 that was caught stockpiling tons of explosive materials at businesses on the outskirts of London. A source told The Telegraph Iran has Hezbollah operatives in position to carry out a terrorist attack in the event of a conflict. Well, whose side of this conflict will many people in Britain be on? We've seen things like this on the streets every other week for months. The pro-Palestine brigade run amok. We've got a serving MP, a former leader of the Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn, who was present at a wreath-laying ceremony for the Munich terrorist David Lammy, has already rowed back on arms sales to Israel. There are certain UK arms exports to Israel. There does exist a clear risk that they might be used to commit or facilitate a serious violation of international humanitarian law. Well, and our current Prime Minister, Sir Keir Starmer, has a Labour Party that's completely split over Israel. I mean, the threat to Britain is absolutely massive, and we've never had a government or a society so divided when it comes to issues of the Middle East. Well, I'm joined now by political commentator and broadcaster, Mayor Tusi. Mayor, thank you very, very much. And the reason I wanted to bring you on is because you have some experience of Iranian sleeper cells and bad actors acting on the streets of Britain. How worried should we be about an attack here? Well, the ordinary people uh, are in this country should be worried. Um, well, what the Iranian regime have been doing for the past few decades is that uh, they've uh, planted their people and they're on different levels. So you actually have some of them publicly. The uh, sons and daughters of the IRGC leaders are living in luxury in places like Chelsea and Kensington. They go to nightclubs, they do drugs and alcohol, they do whatever they want while their parents are oppressing the people in the country. And there have been some people in the past, their analysts have said, that, well, that might have been MI5's tactic to keep them close here, to keep an eye on them. But that's just one layer. You actually have the rest of them who are not necessarily Iranian, but they are the, the, the proxies. So there could be, for example, Hezbollah members. They are all not currently activated. And these people would be activated if the Islamic Republic of Iran is about to fall. And the other problem is that there's a third layer, which is basically the rest of the brainwashed Islamists, who some of them would join the pro-Palestinian protests. And these are the people who would cause trouble, but... The good thing about the, the, the Islamist, Islamist side are that, is that they're going to say, oh, it's just a lone wolf. It's just an isolated mm. incident. They're not going to take responsibility. So what would that look like then? Do, do you think that we could seriously now be uh, on the brink of, not just here in Britain, by the way, but I would imagine right across Western Europe, uh, Iran being able to activate sleeper cells? Yes, I mean, um, we haven't really taken seriously threats from others, including the Chinese Communist Party that have had uh, secret police stations in Manhattan, in London and other places. The Iranian regime as well, and uh, they have their own versions of these sort of uh, entities. And uh, the Canadian government, the British government, the US um, Democrats, for example, they've been funding these Islamists. They've been giving them money. They've been actually cooperating behind closed doors because... The tactic is the strategy is always to de-escalate. They didn't really think about the consequences. We can actually have problems. For example, myself, uh, a lot of people would know if they watch my channel that I've been targeted uh, outside where I live uh, by people who are linked to the embassy. Of course, the authorities help keep me keep, uh, keep me safe. We had another British Iranian journalist who was uh, also stabbed in London a few months ago. Uh, these things will happen on a regular basis, and it's not really just about those with links to Iran, but it will be other people as well.
Yeah, the threat would be any country that supports Israel in what it's doing in any way, shape or form can get it as far as they are concerned. Mayor, look, thank you very, very much for coming on tonight. Great to have you right at the top of the 10 o'clock. It's Mayor Tuesday there, political commentator, broadcaster. Also, make sure you do check him out on YouTube. Um, now, GB News is Home and Security Editor Mark White is back with us. Mark, look, thank you very much. You know, we've been talking a bit there about the threat of those sleeper cells on the streets of Britain. I mean, it is a massive concern. I mean, how stretched are our intelligence services when it comes to that kind of thing? Well, they're working flat out. Of course, they have an Islamist problem, a very significant Islamist problem that they're dealing with in this country anyway. Uh, and that was long before the situation in Gaza arose, which added a new dimension to that. Remember, in October of last year, we saw a pensioner murdered, stabbed to death and two others injured by an asylum seeker uh, up in Hartlepool. He was later convicted, sentenced to life in prison. That attack was revenge for Gaza. We've seen other attacks in Germany and in France in recent months again linked to Gaza. So every possibility the security services are working on the potential for there to be a reaction to what is happening in southern Lebanon and Iran's involvement there now. Uh, the terror threat level in the UK at the moment remains at moderate, meaning an attack in is likely. Uh, that's at the kind of median point. There's no indication that will rise. But clearly, as the situation on the ground in the Middle East changes day by day, there's every possibility that we could see the terror threat level here in the UK rise at some point as well. Well, look, let's just say, as, as pictures now, uh, for anyone who's watching us on, on television, you know, are showing that attack earlier, launched by Iran, hundreds of missiles, some of them appearing to get through. Um, what, what next, Mark? You know, the world has been holding its breath here. Israel's presumably going to hit back at some point. What's that going to look like? Well, interestingly, uh, the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has said this evening that Iran has made a big mistake and will pay the price. Vice Admiral, Rear Admiral uh, Daniel Agari, who is the military spokesman in Israel, also saying that that um, response from Israel would be at a time and of a manner of Israel's choosing. So we await to see what that response will be. Iran has said that it is ready for whatever the retaliation is from Israel. Um, and clearly, if Israel do launch a significant attack on the regime in Tehran, then, then there is real potential for this to escalate even further. The hope is that it won't. Uh, Keir Stammer, of course, the UK Prime Minister, saying tonight that he stands firmly behind Israel, but uh, not giving us any indication, Patrick, as to whether UK military personnel were involved mm. in defending Israel tonight. Look, Mark, thank you very much, not just for this, but for everything you've been doing for us over the course of the day. It's Mark White now, our Home and Security Editor. Two main points for me now that I'm going to put to my panel. I'm going to be talking about this threat of Iranian-backed terror sleeper cells, but also whether or not Sir Keir Starmer actually can deal with this. Can he even deal with his own party when it comes to this issue? Um, Stephen, I'll, I'll start with you. You know, Keir Starmer has got a divided party on this. They had to lean on allegations, he denies, Lindsay Hoyle over a Gaza ceasefire vote. David Lammy just withdrawn some arms sales to Israel. Now he's standing up saying, I support Israel full scale. I mean, he can't even control his own backbenchers on this. If it kicks off, we're in trouble, aren't we? I'm going to say something that you think will surprise you from my view about Keir Starmer. And I'll, I'll say it because I, I think Keir Starmer is a managerialist. I think he's part of the view that is pretty much elitist and establishmentarian. And, and I suspect he will do exactly what he's told about Israel, give it full support, because that's what the Americans want, expect you to do. And that's what he will do. And I, I think he will carry on doing that, just as Tony Blair did. But can the Foreign Secretary do that, though? Well, that's the he's, point. He's, and this is know, where I think, it, it, I, I think Keir Starmer will probably see this as an opportunity for himself. It, just as Tony Blair did, that if people start stepping out of line on the Israeli issue, mm. he can put the foot down and get rid of them or move them away. And he's still got enough power at the moment, because he's so new in the job, that a lot of people are still trying to find their feet. 
So I suspect he will be in power and he can segment his own rule here very strongly. He will not veer from supporting Israel and he won't allow others to try and step in. Others will try, but I think he will have an opportunity to do otherwise. I mean, I think that's an interesting uh, take considering his biggest challenge, if, if your theory is correct, would be David Lammy. Um, because I, I do think that he kind of just have a different opinion from, from Keir Starmer and kind of this unquestionable support for Israel. I mean, that sort of 30 arms embargo fiasco, it was basically a symbolic gesture because it doesn't really mean much. And sort of embargo on like 30 irrelevant parts of, of different equipment. Um, I, I do think, though, the bigger question here is not necessarily on Keir Starmer and his ability to manage his party in this, but it's really David Lamy. Does David Lamy inspire confidence in this kind of precarious time in the world? And my answer to that is, no, yep. um, because I think he's way out of his depth. I think that sort of symbolic act of, of, of the arms embargo, I mean, you either sell them the arms or you don't, right? But to, to, when, when you do that, when you straddle the fence, when you, you seem more concerned with, with gesture politics and with sort of identity politics going to the UN and talking about how you're a black man being there, I'm like, okay, have you ever heard of yeah. Kofi Annan? Like, what are, you, what are you talking about? Like, why is this relevant, right? And, and I remember watching this being yeah. like, I, it was like a badge of honor as a Ghanaian. I was like, oh, Kofi Annan, UN Secretary General, you know, Ghanaian and all of and then you have this man who, who's, who's yeah. got to a very high office in British politics. And, and that's his kind I mean, of claim the, to fame. Yeah, the, the, idea, the idea w w would be this, Jonathan, that, that, you know, we're about to see one of the greatest foreign policy crises that we have ever seen. And now in charge of that, we have an appalling foreign secretary. Oh, <laughs> you're <laughs> such a troll. <laughs> Patrick, I feel like... <laughs> It's Groundhog Day. I do not understand the absolute obsession <laughs> with David Lamy. It is completely baffling. Well, he's a foreign secretary. Yeah, I do not understand. We have had, we have had, we have had a conversation about whether David Lamy is out of his depth three times. My goodness, this is this well, completely. Because one time he turned up no, with trainers to see I the president. I feel like I feel like we've another time he's you know this is also this is completely ludicrous. It's There's not. nothing wrong with David Lamy. You might disagree with his politics. Doesn't mean he's out of his depth in the job. Liz Truss was out of her depth. For the job. Well, David uh, fine, Robert Rob is out of his depth in the job. His politics on this are squiffy on Israel. They're not. I don't know what that means, Patrick. In Israel, then that could be a bit of an issue. It's completely ludicrous. Do you think he's fully, Lamy, fully square? Lamy, Lamy, Jonathan, the do you think David is fully squarely behind Israel in the whole, or do you think he might have slightly different views? I don't actually care what is going on inside David Lamy's head, because what, uh, what, that David, may be Lamy, a problem. what David Lamy did... Mm. on that limited arms embargo, and I think he should have gone further, was that he was literally following out, following through <laughs> the, the recommendations of a report that David Cameron had actually commissioned, I believe, about whether British exports okay. could, were guaranteed uh, not to be involved in war crimes right. because that would implicate Britain. That's completely legitimate for a British government to do. All right, OK, fine. Be interesting to see how Israel feels about this because, you know, Iran clearly don't fear the consequences, do they? Joe Biden... Allegedly still in charge. Well, I don't think we're supp supplying exports. Well, I mean, I think it's sporting arms to Iran, Patrick. It's sporting arms to Iran. A Labour government here. But I don't think Biden's been in charge for a long time. It's a problem. Yeah, <laughs> quite. Let me just do, we've got a couple of minutes left on this. Just want to touch on uh, what we were hearing from Mayor Tusi there, as well as a, um, just to resurrect a report that was in the Telegraph um, a couple of years ago about MI5 actually getting hold of a, 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 a sleeper cell here that was trying to plot explosives on the outskirts of London, they were related to Hezbollah. So this, this notion that we have got sleeper cells here in this country that could pose a massive problem, could be activated at a time like this, if Iran suffers, are you concerned about that? Well, I think if they, uh, the, the idea that there are sleeper cells is not something that I would generally have thought is something Iran can do, but if MI5 are saying it's there and they've got evidence to do so, then we should be concerned about it. I know what's happened to Maya. I've seen that mm. in, in particularly. I, saw, I watched the is issue with him, and I know particularly that's of concern, not just to him, but other activists who oppose Iran. And that, that's something that's deeply concerning, because I go back, go back to the point of Esther. It's individuals that yeah. can just step out. And they're the ones who are likely to And they're the biggest threat like as well, because you can... You can, you can monitor sleeper cells you can follow them around you can you can see what they're planning you can you can intercept communication mm. and all of that you can't do that for a madman that wakes up one day takes a knife from his kitchen and goes to stab also, a, an I'd old be, man running at i'm 5 slightly worried about mi5 because they've got a track record of failure 
on this. Well, yes, I mean, there's always, there's always the that risk. They the attacks in London. Yeah. They actually actively supported the person that caused the attacks in Manchester by bringing them over well, and we'll doing nothing about, about it. Soon, yeah. So, um, you know, yeah. they, they've got blood on their hands and they, they either have to step up on their game to make sure it doesn't happen again. I'd like to make sure that I have confidence in them. But after Manchester, I don't, still don't. Well, there's also the risk. But there's also the... They the, 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 actively, the, 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 actively the got on their hands. They actively supported bringing in the person. Well, hold on. The they're, they're charged with the nation's security, but there's also the, the yeah. risk of, of, and of political correctness actually Im impeding their, uh, their efficacy. Mm. We know that one in five people convicted of terrorist offences since 1998 have been in an asylum background. That's not insignificant. That's 20%. And yet if you mention the risk of people coming over from a, with, with asylum backgrounds that have a higher than average level, Level of yeah. extremism, you know, you're sort of maligned as saying, oh, but you don't want to bring in, you know, yeah. poor refugees it's, from other parts of the world. But what concern. we are saying is actually young males that are refugees are a bigger threat than, let's say, women and children, which I, th I think should be favoured. It, it would be a concern, personally. especially if we look at issues that are taking place in another part of the world. It would be a concern as to whether or not we had imported people who happened to support people that, that, that we weren't in that conflict. Of course, it would be.